Right, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome back to Stay Informed, Stay Connected, Shape the Future, our monthly series of interactions between the Australian High Commissioner, the Honourable Barry O'Farrell AO, and Australian alumni. Our, dis our discussion today, which is very timely, will be on sports and the impact of COVID-19 on this field. Joining us on this episode are Barry O'Farrell, the Australian High Commissioner in India, Sanaina Jaswal and Sahail Chandok. They are passionate about sport, all of them. They have been sports people themselves and are closely associated with the sector, both in Australia and India. Welcome Barry, Sanaina and Sahail. Before we start, just a quick reminder on the house rules. Please keep yourself muted at all times to avoid disturbing the proceedings. If you're having any bandwidth issues, please try switching off your video to enjoy the session. Should you drop out, please try logging in again and rejoining. If we, if we drop out due to network work issues at our end, please stay patient and stay in there. We will join back as quick as we can. We have received questions from many of you. Thanks so much. We'll be keeping up some of the relevant questions this evening, uh, taking them up, but there might be some we can't get to, and we'll try to bring them forward in other sessions. Until a few months ago, if I said sports, Australia and India, I'm sure most of you would immediately think of our brilliant cricketers pitted against each other with a stadium full of fans. It's hard to believe that only, it was only five months ago uh, that we had that fantastic women's T20 World Cup final with 100,000 odd people at the Melbourne Cricket Ground. Our current situation feels so different from that, from that now. I hope this evening's session will offer some insights, not only to the breadth of Australia and Indian engagement in sports, but what the future holds with the current disruptions. Before we move on, on taking, on taking up, up the and hearing it from our fantastic panellists, I would like to invite the High Commissioner, the Honourable Barry O'Farrell, who is himself a keen supporter of sports in the Australia-India partnership, to give us a bit of an overview and introduction. Thank you, High Commissioner. Well, thank you all again for joining us tonight. And can I just say, uh, I'm glad Pat finally corrected it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sport consumer uh, I do not have a history in sport, as Pat suggested uh, in his earlier introductions. Uh, indeed, when I used to play uh, cricket in my son's father's group, they used to call me morally because they never knew what was going to come out of my hand. So, uh, so I have no sporting credentials at all, except like many people around the world in India and Australia, uh, I'm passionate about watching it. So. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to see you here this evening. I'm looking forward to the discussion with Sanaina and, and Sanil. Since all, of, um, since all of you have spent time in Australia, you'll understand what I mean when I say it's a sports away of life for most Australians. Um, some, think, some think this is part of our natural advantage, such as our beaches and our wide open spaces. Nevertheless, a lot is due to our government's commitment to ensuring that sports promote healthy lifestyles, strong communities, and industry opportunities. In 2018, the Australian government released a sports strategy, Sport 2030, uh, which is the national sport plan. And this sets out well, its, its commitment to ensuring that Australia remains the world's most active and healthy nation, known for our sporting integrity and success. Well, at least that's, they're the goals. The plan outlines four priority areas. Firstly, encouraging more Australians to be more active more often achieving international sporting excellence, safeguarding the integrity of sport, and finally, strengthening Australia's sport and recreation industry. Many of these build on Australia's already renowned capability, capabilities in sport, such as our world-class infrastructure and education expertise. Sporting bodies around the world, for example, recognise our premier training institution, the Australian Institute of Sport, for its high performance programs. International bodies also hold in high regard the sports governance structure established through the Australian Sports Commission, a body funded by the Australian Government. 
Australia's engagement with India in the sports sector is broad and multi-layered. Everyone knows about our great cricket rivalry, but I'm sure Sahail can elaborate from his experience. But both as Sahail and Sanayana's careers demonstrate, sport, sport engagement between Australia and India, whether competitive or on the field or cooperative off the field, spans many sports and subsectors. The sports industry was identified as a promising sector in Australia's India economic strategy. And in 2017, Australia and India renewed our MOU on sports cooperation. And this move recognised Australia's strength in the sector and India's ambition to improve its sports administration and its infrastructure. Uh, Australian government and institutions have also developed strong partnerships, particularly at the state level in Gujarat, Kerala, Punjab and Rajasthan. Uh, these partnerships have helped improve capability and capacity, uh, develop athlete pathways and broaden grassroots participation. The success of one such partnership between Punjab and the Victoria University paved the way for the university's agreement uh, with the Government of India to assist with curricula, research facilities and laboratories at India's first national sport university. Another uh, Australian university leading the way is Deakin University, Sanaina's alma mater. The 2020 QS World uh, University World Rankings named Deakin as a top 10 university for sports science and sports management. Both courses attract a strong cohort of Indian students. Finally, demonstrating our breadth of experience, the University of Queensland has entered into a partnership with Jindal University to develop sports law uh, and governance courses in technology. Australia is home to Catapult Sport, uh, a world leading sports analytics to optimise the uh, athlete fitness performance and recovery. And Catapult started in 2006 as a partnership between the AIS and the Australian Government Cooperative Research Centres and today is, listed, uh, is a listed company with over 340 staff working with almost 3,000 teams across 39 sports. Catapult's technology, of course, is used by India's national football and hockey teams, six Indian Super League teams, including the champions teams, Balangaroo and, and Chennai, and, uh, and Symbiosis International University. Uh, the tech also makes for great entertainment, and whenever you hear great commentators such as Sahail analysing players, there's a good chance that Catapult is assisting the data uh, for their insights. Our commercial sports partnership with India go even further into sectors you'd not immediately associate with sport. For example, the Walmart company, a leading Australian wool brand, maker of my suit, is working with Indian fitness companies to manufacture sportswear in India. Even Sardar Patel Stadium in Ahmedabad is the, world, the, the world's largest cricket stadium, host to the US president earlier in the year, was designed by an Australian architectural firm, Populous, led by an Australian architect, uh, Maxwell Glenn, not Glenn Maxwell. Our engagement is not just commercial. Sports imparts values and lessons that are vital for broader development objectives such as health, hygiene, women's empowerment, and of course, disability inclusion. In 2016, the Australian government launched the $4 million Australian sport, uh, Asian Sports Development uh, Partnership program to expand Australia's sports for development cooperation across Asia. And in India, this program funded several partnerships with a focus on health, inclusion and sustainability through a range of sports from boxing, hockey, all the way through to, uh, to netball. Meanwhile, um, DFAT's Small Grants uh, Direct Aid Program has helped women's wheelchair basketball teams compete in international tournaments, use Kabaddi as a way to educate girls in Mumbai slums on hygiene and promote a disability inclusion with India's World Cup men's blind cricket team. These initiatives build positive people-to-people -people ties between our two nations and do an enormous amount for those involved. Our Indian partners drive much of this momentum. Just like in cricket or tennis, timing is everything in business and diplomacy. And I've visited India many times over the years to observe how it's changing. To my eyes, consumers are increasingly conscious of, of health and fitness. Uh, the success of Australian vitamin supplements and skincare company Swiss is a telling example. And uh, the company launched in India in February this year and five months later, during the Amazon Promotions Day, it received a $1 million Australian order, one of its biggest single overseas orders in its history. So thanks to the rising incomes and access, health and wellbeing markets are no longer restricted to big metros and athletes have also gained prominence in popular culture. 
I'm told that in recent years, Indian filmmakers are focused on uh, the stories behind successful sportsmen and women. One to revisit might be MS Dhoni, The Untold Story, particularly after recent announcements. And the most notable, I'm told, is Dungal, uh, the highest grossing Indian uh, film ever. And these films inspire young Indians uh, to embrace, uh, from all backgrounds, to, em to embrace sport. Meanwhile, government initiatives such as Kalo India, which is pro providing training support to promote to promising sports talent and the new education policy are encouraging steps towards fostering sporting talent and these initiatives uh, should be applauded. Um, sadly, today we find ourselves caught in a disruptive moment and as someone who starts his day with a visit to the Commission's small gym, I know the toll that COVID-19 lockdowns have on motivation and activity. Many of us find ourselves exercising in front of laptops in our living rooms. Uh, team sports have taken a particular hit, and who knows when we'll see professional events return to normal. Yet it's also more important than ever to ensure that people remain, to ensure a fit and healthy uh, population. In India, like elsewhere in the world, the pandemic's inflicting immense pressure on the healthcare system. And this is not directly struck by the virus. Those not directly struck by the virus are experiencing the mental health issues associated with lockdowns and isolation, particularly among our young people. However, I believe that uh, existing Australian and India sports relationships provide a strong foundation on which we can build a happier, healthier, and more competitive future together. We don't need to wait around until after the pandemic. Today's innovative ideas will ensure a strong rebound for the sports ecosystem in the longer term. With 50% of the population of India under 28, um, it can make a critical shift now to ensure a more healthy sports uh, culture post-pandemic. And I look forward to hearing from the experts joining us tonight, great Australian alumni, about how sports ecosystems are responding to the COVID-19 crisis and where they see the emerging opportunities for Australia's sporting cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, High Commissioner for laying down for us some broader context for today's conversation. I would now like to welcome Sanina Jaswal, who works with Tennis Australia and is a club development officer for, for tennis in Queensland to talk about her journey into the world of sports, how she sees the future of this sector and the possibilities of collaboration between our two countries. Sanina is a qualified sports management professional with experience in a variety of roles from marketing, public relations, stakeholder management, events and operations. So Sanina has a Master's of Business degree in sports management from Deakin University, uh, which we heard about before. She currently works with Tennis Australia and is involved with strategic planning, community engagement and the overall development of tennis in Queensland. And as a Queenslander who likes tennis, that's very important. Sanina so is an ardent sports person herself and passionate about soccer and football and tennis. She has volunteered her time with community sporting clubs, Australia University of Sport, Cycling Victoria, World Wildlife Fund and the Deakin Graduate Business Society. Over to you, Sanina. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us and of course for having uh, me here. Um, my journey in the world of sport, I think, began way back in my childhood when I was brought up in the tea gardens of Assam, and my father has always been a very passionate sports person himself. So uh, my sister and I both were encouraged to play sport in our formative years, and it was probably in boarding school, I uh, went to the Assam Valley School in the eighth and the ninth grade, where uh, I think I did take that decision to specialize. Otherwise, I was playing everything, so focused on tennis and football, and that became uh, something that I was absolutely passionate about and enjoyed it a lot. Um, as uh, Patrick touched upon, I've uh, got experience in uh, roles in marketing, public relations, and uh, before moving into the sporting industry, I was working in a, a media and entertainment uh, company and I uh, decided to make an off-court career out of sport in 2015 and that's when I traveled to Melbourne, uh, did my master's business in uh, Deakin University and uh, I think it's been quite a journey since. I presently work for the governing body of tennis in Australia, mainly assisting in sport development, uh, assisting a lot of our regional clubs in Queensland uh, with uh, community participation and, you know, just supporting 
volunteers with the kind of resources and assistance that they require to be able to play the sport. Um, I, I would like to share, though, in terms of a few things that, about the Australian sporting industry that uh, has been core to my growth and experience. And uh, when I moved here, I think the importance of uh, volunteering was something that really um, came up and um, just recognition for these volunteers in your community and making them champions of our sport and getting the community involved in actually uh, making a difference to how the sport grows. Uh, so for me, um, apart from, I mean, I did have the opportunity, uh, as Patrick mentioned, to volunteer with organizations like Australian University of Sport, Cycling Victoria, where I did a little bit of research and and assisting them in increasing participation for women uh, riders in the state of Victoria. Um, also did an internship with Deakin University, the South Asia team, uh, and the Adidas India when I came back to India for a two-month holiday. I don't think my mother was too happy with that because I spent all my time working in... Um, it was fantastic. I think working with Adidas India as well, uh, they were working on the FC Bar and Youth Cup, uh, that was engaging across 3,000 young athletes uh, across four cities and over a span of two months. So working with them on event operations and promotions, I think all this volunteering experience really counts for something um, and, you know, assists you in growing on um, practically when you are in the field. Uh, the other thing was the strategic approach that sport takes in Australia. So you've got national bodies that then roll out a strategic plan, uh, rolling into state member associations like Tennis Queensland, like I work for, uh, and then also the community clubs, which are on a majority run by volunteers, adopting that strategic plan. I think it's important to, even at a community level to adopt uh, a strategic approach to whatever they do because in the end that's where the government, the council, um, the federal funding for sport comes and I think assisting them in, you know, building those uh, sustainable venues. And it was extremely interesting to take that viewpoint. And obviously with everything that we do now, it is uh, that we follow very closely in terms of having a strategy in our plans. Um, importance of networking and staying connected, another core experience. That is something that, that really pushed me into uh, you know, getting into and working with the Commonwealth Games, uh, the Australian Open, Brisbane International, all major events. Uh, I did reach out to Women's Sport Australia, which was um, an organization of ladies that had come together in uh, Melbourne where it was formed. But they actually got me uh, connected to Lauren Penny, who is has been in the sporting industry, has an events company of her own. And I think that mentorship from another woman in this industry, I mean, it was a. I mean, even though I'd, I'd studied theoretically in Australia, I think it's very different to the way the business model is uh, when you're actually on ground working. So having that direction by someone uh, who had the experience was absolutely fantastic. Um, uh, just a few more points was uh, another thing was the focus on grassroots sporting programs and. I know India has a lot of grassroots programs and it's fantastic with the way they're reaching out to, uh, you know, kids, I mean, at a younger age to uh, educate them about the sport. And um, I think with tennis specifically that I can talk about is that even the grassroots programs have a modified uh, approach, so it's modified play, uh, making it easier, smaller rackets, lesser compression balls. And I think all of that makes it easier and fun for players at a young age. So you want them to come back to the sport. You want it to be fun. You want want to be able to retain them. And um, I think uh, the last one was mainly that inclusive approach to all, A, all different sports. So you've got AFL, rugby, cricket, tennis, swimming. They all, all, all the national bodies have their strategic plans. They have their pathways, whether that's on the field or on the court or whether that's off it for officials, coaches, tournament directors. So I think um, that was something that was interesting to see where all sports are treated equally uh, and also inclusiveness in 
you know, raising the profile in the overall inclusion space when it comes to multicultural communities, uh, linguistically diverse communities. You've got uh, disability um, underrepresented groups in in Australia, indigenous programs with different partnerships that we have. So uh, I think overall there was a lot to take away from in my theoretical and practical experience. And eventually I think one more thing I'd like to add while working with major events, I thought sport is, uh, rather than just the on-court players and elite performance, there's a lot of focus on the experience that people have when they come to an event like that. So when we did host the ATP Cup, last year for the first time in Australia. Um, and my role specifically in Brisbane was uh, working on consulate engagement and activating these diverse communities to uh, you know, come for the very boring. So, um, yeah, long yeah. Long yeah. Long South Africans, French, all coming together yeah. to the yeah. arena to support their teams and also be a part of, uh, you know, tennis and celebrate the sport. So it's been a fantastic journey so far. Uh, there's so much I've learned and uh, so much more to go. So thank you for having me here as well. Sanaina, thank you very much for that fantastic outline of sport, the sporting environment in Australia. I would now like to introduce Sahail Chandok, our next panelist. Uh, Sahail is a former professional sports person. This is amazing, hailing back from three generations of sports persons. Uh, Sahail is currently one of Australia's leading well, sorry, India's leading sports presenters, in fact, you're probably leading in Australia too, uh, and commentators. And you may recognise him as the face of coverage of a lot of major sporting events covering the Indian Premier League, Pro Kabaddi League, Wimbledon, Indian Super, Super League football, the ICC Cricket World Cups, Premier League ba Badminton, the Rio Olympics, and many others. He's also a co-founder of sports and tech startup Kabaddi Ada, where he applies his marketing and strategic business consultant skills, learning uh, learned during his, career, his degree in commerce from the University of Adelaide. While studying, Sahail became India's first recipient of the Oxford and Cambridge Half Blue Award for Sporting Excellence in Cricket at Adelaide University. During his time in Australia, Sahail also became a Cricket Australia Level 2 coach and coached at the South Australia Cricket Association and in women's cricket, the likes of Australian World Cup winners, Megan Schutt and Shelley Nishke. Over to you, Sahail. Thanks so much, Pat. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, good evening, Honourable Minister. Good evening to all the alumni and everyone else that joins us this evening. Uh, it's a pleasure and thank you for inviting me to share my thoughts on the future of sport and also synergies between two countries. Uh, one that's I guess the home that I was born into and the other that I called my home after I've spent, uh, you know, four years there. Uh, I've got to say that although I'm a bag of hot air for a living now as a sports broadcaster, it's still hard to put some of the best years of my life into a few minutes, but I'll, I'll try anyway. Uh, to give you a, a brief background, I was born into sport, I guess, in, in many ways, into three generations of motorsport, but I was maybe the black sheep that didn't take two to four wheels, uh, much to perhaps the, the delight of my dad, who maybe the entire cost of my cricket career would have been the cost of the right front tire of my brother's Formula One car. So uh, it worked out in one sense. But uh, I've got to say, I think the choice to move to Australia wasn't something that was um, a long term one. It was sort of an immediate one. Uh, I was someone that grew up playing and watching every sport possible. Uh, and I think that passion for me vibed with what Australia stands for as well. Uh, I was actually all set to go to Loughborough University in Leicestershire uh, in England and everything was said. My brother doesn't live far from there. I knew people in England and you know, it was all set to go there. And then suddenly the choice of Adelaide popped up, uh, got in touch with the university and the cricket club there and somehow made the decision to, to see the sun for more than 10 days of the year uh, and chose Adelaide over Leicestershire. And I think looking back, uh, and I don't just say this because I'm here on an Australian platform, but Looking back, it's probably the best decision or one of the best decisions I've made in my life. Um, I think I wanted at that time more out of life than just being a cricketer, but to develop more as a person. And I think that's what I found a lot with Australia and just the lifestyle there as well. Just the outdoor nature, it, it vibed with who I was as a person. Uh, I started university in 2006 and sort of that's where I began life as a cricketer as well. And it, I can't say it all went smoothly or well at the start. Uh, I started, I remember, in C grade and had scores of 0, 
10, 4, and 0 in my first four games. Uh, and I was thinking, wow, this is uh, not really the dream I aspired for. But this is where I think Australia was very different because following that round of scores and no matches thereafter, I went into postseason training um, and based on absolutely nothing except for my training ethos and, and the work put in there, I was drafted into the A-grade squad straight after with no match play uh, beyond those, well, not, not inspiring scores. Uh, and sure enough, had a, had a 50 on my A-grade debut and was suddenly finding myself alongside the likes of Jason Gillespie and Sean Tate and Darren Lehman and all of these guys. And it's sort of the, the meritocracy of it for me that really stood out. And I think for someone who knew absolutely nobody in Australia to land up, uh, you know, as a kid out of nowhere and, and be moved up the ranks so quickly based on just ability and work ethic rather than anything else. For me, that was something that was really important looking back as well. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. I think uh, the faith that, that went into it as well, just it vibed with who I was as a person, but also the discipline aspect of putting more into university life. I think the myth of, of you know, the balance of sport and academics not going hand in hand is something that I think is a complete myth. And, and that's something that I found with Australia. There's always this balance about making sure you can do as much as you can with your passion, whether that be cricket, football, uh, you know, rugby or, or anything else. It's just going to the gym. You don't make a hue and cry about it. You just get on with it. And I, I think when you look back at, at some of the Australian coaches that have taken on the India job as well, it's funny because uh, uh, for the lack of the better or, or for better word, the, the no bullshit approach of, of Australia really vibed with me. I loved it because it meant that I could grow faster. It meant that I could make changes quicker. It, made, it meant that I could know exactly what I needed to do with feedback that was honest. And I know that doesn't sit very well with, with, uh, with the Indian mentality sometimes of wanting to go around the bush and come back to the point and be softer about it. But I think that was something that really stood out to me as well in terms of getting better faster. Uh, and I think that was for me why I wanted to do as much as I could within that span of time and took on a, a double degree there. So I did study. I did come away with uh, the marketing award at the end of it. So uh, my folks were, were happy as well at the end of it all. But I think for me, the cricket got better. Uh, and in my final year, scored three back-to-back -back hundreds in Melbourne, Sydney and Adelaide. Uh, uh, came away after coaching a women's side and taking them to second in the premiership uh, that year. And I think for me, the, the, the sort of the coaching aspect of women's cricket came full circle when I managed to see uh, Megan win the World Cup on Indian soil in Mumbai, actually, a few years ago. And it was, a, it was sort of a, a goosebumpy, um, uh, sort of nice moment to just say, hang on, that, that really meant something to me because I think that's another aspect that India is growing with today, uh, women's sport and women's cricket. But I don't think it is where it needs to be. I think there's a there's a large thought process about how only women should be involved in women's sport and and, and only women understand the women's side of women's sport here. But I think uh, even given the way Australia has done the WBBL or, or or you know heads women's football in Australia, I do think there's a lot that can be learned from the system there and can be adopted into India. Uh, having said that, you know coming into to India over the last uh, decade now and, and having switched jobs and uh, in, in some way losing the dream of chasing a cricket playing goal, but now being a broadcaster. There's a lot that I think I took away from Australia in the sense of the confidence building that I got from there, the ability to have uh, you know built my own life and career on my own in a country that I knew no one uh, when I went into as well. And I think sport teaches you a lot of that better than anything else. And, and like I said before, I think Australia's sporting culture is something that most other countries around the world are, are looking to imbibe, right? I think India is moving forward with the Kalo India Games, with the Fit India movement, and we're heading in the right direction. But I still think, you know, we're, we're behind the eight ball, and it's great to see a country of 1.2 billion take the step towards that. So, uh, you know, while I think uh, we, we're all, you know, we've all got our goals and we've got these scripted paths towards how we've got to get there, I think it, it changes along the way, and you've got to sort of be... Um, like water, like a bit like water and be fluid enough to see challenges and move around them and see them as a stepping stone to something else. So for me, uh, you know, like I said, I've spoken more about sport here than, than anything else, but I love the academic side of it. I think it was, there was a practical side to it, which uh, really uh, stood out to me as well, uh, where you, were, you had so many different cultures coming together. I've got to say I, I had an absolute blast. I think I had a total of maybe three Indian friends. It wasn't conscious, but I think 
I went out to to see a different side of the world, to to you know vibe with a different side of the world, and I I love that. Uh, I, I had more genuinely close Australian friends than anything else, and today I've got a home in every city in Australia, maybe every time I head across. So I think that's the the added bonus of it. But at the at the end of it all, I think as humans, we're all born to play. I think we we're all born with an innate nature to want to play. We've got a ball, a bat, a rattle, uh, and a box that we play with as kids, right? And that's either nurtured as we grow up or it's blunted depending on your parentage or your society or, or you know, the myths of academics and sport. And I do think that Australia has that ability to nurture that while also seeing the other side of life and, and finding that sort of middle ground to, to a balanced life. So for me, that's my takeaway from perhaps my, my four years uh, crunched into a, a few minutes, but uh, uh, I've got to say that uh, the, the three years at university and uh, the added year at the cricket club there and, and spending time at Saka and the, the women's cricket team that I coached with were uh, some of the most memorable. And I look back now and uh, I've got great friends from Australia back then and, and great friends now that I share the screen with uh, in the form of guys like Brett Lee and Dean Jones and Mitchell Johnson and guys like that who uh, sort of keep giving me the flavor of Australia every time I, I, I miss it. So uh, it, it's nice that it's sort of moved around and uh, maybe I've trusted life to say, okay, I'm, I'm done with a cricket playing career with uh, uh, involuntary basis, but it's nice to still see uh, that side of it in touch. And uh, no, it's, it's it's wonderful to say in touch with uh, Australian universities as well. And I guess that's the one thing I'm hoping there can be more of. I think the, the one takeaway I would like to see more of is is more um, proactive synergies between Australian universities with with those of us that are here and would love to do more and love to be more involved. So uh, thank you for having me and, and hope I can uh, add a little bit more value on the future of sport as well with everyone's questions. Thanks very much for that, Sahel, for that fantastic uh, outline of your experience, both in Australia, but then coming back to India uh, and what sport's all about. Um, I think both Sahail and Sanaina, you've kind of really outlined the different pathways, not just being athletes, what out, what's out there for administrators, event managers, coaches, and how we can collaborate together as countries. Um, so we've got plenty of time, which is great, perhaps about 20 minutes for some question and answer. Um, thanks very much to all our fantastic alumni who have brought to us some brilliant questions traversing many of the themes that we've already heard from our three speakers tonight. So thanks very much for that. Uh, to kick things off, um, and one of the big themes that we've also been thinking about has been the impact of COVID-19. Uh, and a shout out to Manpreet Singh, Kanika Chowan, Disney George, and Andrew Dore, whose questions really centered around this. Um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll start with some, Sanina, but just to give you an outline, we're really keen to hear from both of you about a roadmap for the next three years in sports. Um, I think uh, we were talking with the High Commissioner before our session, COVID-19 vaccine some time away. What does it look like? How can we make it work? Um, what's going to be the impact on domestic sporting competitions? And how can Australia and India work together to support each other through this difficult time? Sanina, over to you first. I think, um, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, just with the, like, with the times that we live in at the moment with COVID-19, uh, just rolling out different things for the community to be able to support them to actually play sport, I think that's been uh, something that's been interesting. So I would just go back to answering the roadmap for the next few years. Sorry about that. Uh, in terms of uh, the strategic approach that I did mention when I spoke about my experience in Australian sport, I do feel that in the next few years, this strategy would, there would be a lot in it that would focus on recovery of sport on how we come back on what resources do we require as uh, you know as governments or companies that are in a position to support communities that are playing with sport um, I think the strategy another thing as part of the three-year roller would be something that I, I work very closely with every day is also pathways and how can we create uh, within a safer environment, how can we create better pathways for uh, players, for others who are off court as well? So in terms, just to go into the universities and, um, you know, the partnerships that we could have, I'd, 
uh, in the region that I work in, we have in September, we've got a Australian Univers University of Sport that has an inter-varsity university competition. And I feel like there's so many platforms, competitions, opportunities to actually build that India-Australia relationship with um, as part of those pathways in the next three years, as part of, uh, you know, a strategy for us to work on better partnerships as well. So whether that's government partnerships or private partnerships. Uh, so, yeah, I think playing in a, on a, on a if, if it's specifically a university level, you start off with uh, state university competitions, national and then possibly looking at exchange programs on an international level as well between India and Australia. Thank you. Thanks for that, Sonata. I think that's a probably quite a good point about, you know, probably have to stage return things, starting more local to state to national and then international in a lot of sport. Um, so, Hale, any thoughts about impacts of COVID-19 and perhaps about how Australia and India can get through this period together in sports? Yeah, I was just listening to you saying uh, it's important to start small and go from there. I think uh, India in some ways has adopted the opposite where we're going big and going or go home strategy with the IPL coming up around the corner. So um, I think it's going to be an interesting one because, uh, look, I think the, the world of 2020 for me in terms of broadcast is the bio bubble, right? I think everyone's talking about the bio bubble and how to secure yourself. Um, uh, I've got a lot of friends who are involved in the England West Indies cricket series uh, that just took place in the England Pakistan series. And while to the to the rest of the world, you, you see it on telly and, and it looks all smooth and, and easy. And, and my brother has been involved with Sky Sports in, in the UK on the Formula One calendar. And I know they're getting tested every five days and every four days and, you know, getting a swab shoved up their nose. And it's not it's not pleasing either, you know. But at the same time, I think you've got to understand how meticulous these processes have to be from a broadcast perspective. I mean, I know with the IPL around the corner, we're talking about even in Mumbai and within Mumbai doing things remotely, but us stationed in a hotel and not living in, in our own homes for, for two months where we're only allowed to interact with the six people that I'm on air with. And, and you know, by, by week three, I'm sure we're going to be sick of each other, but that is the, the reality of the situation. And I think it's the only way forward. But I also think it's a strong message to say, hang on, we're not going to get beaten by this virus, right? And I think um, there are ways around it. It's not foolproof, but it's about how you can come back from it, right? You're always going to get a case somewhere. How do you respond to it? And and I think that's going to be a big test for a country like India as well. Uh, you know, uh, I, mean, I work with Star Sports with, with the IPL coming around, and uh, I know processes are in place, and and we're we're getting different colored armbands and things like that to figure out which bubble you're in, and and all of that's going to happen. But I think what I really like. And it's been encouraging to see uh, whether it's the Premier League, whether it's Formula One, whether it's cricket, uh, tennis to some extent, although Djokovic put a little black mark on, on that one. Um, you know, otherwise, it's, it's been fairly successful to see the way sport has rebounded. And, and you've got to understand that there's so much at play here from sponsorship, from advertising, from people's jobs. I mean, I won't have a job, right, if this, if this doesn't come back to to fruition or you've got your light people or your your event guys your you know, you've got all of this as part of one large industry coming together and i think what's really good to see as i said earlier is the fact that there are ways to counter it but you've got to be absolutely certain that you've got every little process in place because one little pop in that bubble and the entire bubble breaks and uh, you know there's no coming back from there so look i think it we're in uncertain times um no one knows where we're heading uh, as you said pat i think it's going to be a year and a half two years before we see a real vaccine uh, that that works and i think you've got to brace for it right i think you've got to brace for the new normal you've got to pivot uh you know i, I run a i'm a co-founder on a, a tech and sport platform called kabaddi adda and we were essentially trying to build the quick info of kabaddi but we've had to pivot and move into esports right and, and we did that within the first two weeks of, of this because we realized there's a need for it. Uh, and I, I see that being, and I'm not someone who's an esports massive fan either. Look, I, I, you know, I'm a purist of sport, but I think that is the future. Right? Uh, you, you see it, and, and the pandemic has reminded us even more that maybe esports is part of that future and you can't ignore it. So I just think you've got to be more open minded to new possibilities and change what you think was the only way to go. Uh, it, it's, it's all gone out the window. And I think uh, it's making us more less rigid as people and, and more open-minded which 
at, at some level, it's not a bad thing either. Thanks for that, Sahail. And I'm going to stick with you for the first part for this, and then we'll we'll kick to Sanana. Um, yeah. uh, and I think that's some really good points. Elite sport is coming back uh, in a really controlled way. Um, and one of the the, the questions that uh, many of our alumni put to us, and something we've been thinking about too, I know many of my colleagues at our consulates in India, uh, has been the impact on women's sport. Uh, yeah. You've been background as a coach. Um, I think, am I correct that with the IPL, I think there's going to be the, there's going to be some of the games, the women's games are going to be part of the tournament and part of the bubble. Yes. Yes. There will be. So, games, yeah. yeah. So I think interested for both of you, starting with Sahail to really explore a bit, how can we get, and I think that's probably a good, a pretty good example, but how can we bring back women's sport and what does that mean for Australia and India? Yeah. I think we're, we're in two different places. Yeah, right. I think Australia is far ahead when it comes to women's sport, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, the reception side of it and, and how people perceive women's sport. And I think India is very different in that sense as well. And that's that's the reality of it. I, you know, I, I, you can't beat around that fact. Uh, I think on the flip side, there are efforts. I think last year's Women's World Cup did a whole lot for women's sport in India. It really gave Indian cricket uh, a platform uh, and I mean Indian women's cricket, a, a huge platform. Suddenly, the names like Smriti Mandana or you know Julian Goswami and Mitali Raj, of course, was, was in amongst it. But you've got Jamima Rodriguez and the, all these youngsters who are suddenly household names. The only fear is obviously after such a high where everyone was talking about it, there's now this pandemic that's hit and suddenly it's dwindling away because there was supposed to be a series between India and, and England and that fell away by the wayside as well. And I, I do think there's got to be more consistency. And I think that's where, um, you know, obviously the, it's not ideal for Australia's cricketers to not be playing the women's IPL because I know it coincides with the women's BPL. So, you know, it's, it's a tough one there because you had to find this window and fit into it. But I think that's one of the, the tricky ones to try and slot into given the calendar that we've got. Um, on the other side of things, I, I do think there's a, la a large opportunity to find more synergy and maybe more Indian administration has to go across to Australia and just visit a league, whether it's women's soccer, whether it's uh, the women's BBL, and just get an idea of how to promote it, right? What is perception or what was perception like before this kicked off? How are how are people and how are these leagues marketing women's sports differently to, to men's sport? Because I think you've got to understand that even to an audience in India, you've got to have different messaging. It can't just be the same. It can't be hard messaging to, to you know, non non-cricket fans with who've never watched sort of women's sport before in the same manner that you would with the men's IPL. I mean, if, if you're expecting what you get with the men's IPL from the women's IPL, you're going to be, you are going to be disappointed. And I, you know, I, I, I have in no way, uh, you know, I'm all for equality. Like I said, I speak uh, from a perspective of having coached women as well. And, but every women's cricketer will understand and will voice the fact that they are different physically there's there's differences there's there's approach wise differences between the men and the women's game as well and you've got to embrace the good of each right and then highlight that so what exactly you highlight i think determines how it's perceived and how it's watched so i think there's a lot of learnings there from australia to an indian perspective of how to engage audiences and how to make it a bit more lucrative to sponsorship as well So I know you have some thoughts on this, perhaps organisations in Australia who would be good partners for India and women's sport? You on? So I know you're there. Hi, Patrick, can you repeat that, please? I lost you there. Yeah. Yeah? Sorry, I was just going to say over to you, but it was just a thought perhaps just... Uh, sure, so no. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so here, I think I'd just like to add on what you said. I think one of the core things is being uh, able to share that knowledge and sharing that resources and encouraging women. And as you mentioned, the differences, the challenges that they go through, I think, uh, you know, myself uh, trying to get into the sporting industry, I found that I had to uh, take a step back, get my knowledge base and you know learn more about it and then put myself in a better position to then start working in the industry so it wasn't uh, one day just waking up saying i want to work in sport because there were so many so many barriers and preconceived notions and just the mentality as well that 
I think it's a culture of sport for women that, you know, in order to get that equal opportunity as well, that's extremely important. Now, I do realize that, you know, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of build around uh, women in sport in India. And now with COVID, people may feel disheartened uh, knowing that, you know, now there's a little bit of a stop to it. But, you know, I just see that it's this time is so crucial for us as an industry that we actually... Uh, utilize this to be able to uh, plan a safe re return, not only for, I mean, everyone in sport, but specifically programs for women. And that's something we're trying to do. Like internally, I'm just sharing my experience at uh, Tennis Queensland. When we couldn't go out there and we couldn't uh, visit our communities, support them on the ground for facility visits or run competitions and tournaments, uh, the entire organization broke down into project groups and we've come up with plans for the next four years on how we can actually, for women specifically, come up with emerging and future leader programs uh, that would, could potentially involve mentorship programs that could potentially involve, uh, you know, giving players like body an opportunity to come and talk to uh, women about experience, like you know their experiences in sports. So I think women relate to other women's experiences. And I think when those experiences are positive, it encourages. And I think so here I agree with that hard messaging and marketing because it's I feel like the experiences that uh for me it was it allowed me to break down my my subconscious thought processes of oh this is going to be hard and uh, you know I'll make my way through whatever opportunities came my way or whatever um we built um I mean just to, sorry whatever opportunities that came by so I think um yeah we we do need to utilize this time uh very efficiently plan for what we can uh put together for women programs leadership programs professional development you've got so many virtual learning opportunities and I think it would be perfect with, uh, you know, giving Indian uh, women as well as younger girls an opportunity in schools through some schools partnerships with, uh, you know, alumni, for example, they're actually um, more than happy to help out and I know so many of my batchmates would be as well to actually be able to support in that space. That, just, to, just to add uh, to, to Sunana there and to, to this theme, I think the, the one thing that I hope comes out of COVID times is obviously I think the, the reality of it, which isn't as prevalent in, in Australia, is the basic hygiene, right? When you go to a, a playground or a, a field in, in India, you're, you're looking for a separate change room for women. First, you've still firstly got to have a clean change room for men, which quite often doesn't exist in, in so many rural places or uh, parts of India as well. And I think hopefully with, with COVID and, and the need for sanitization and hygiene, maybe it'll encourage more playgrounds, more fields of play to start having a separate uh, women's change room, separate women's bathroom and things like that. Because I think small things like that will encourage more women to come into sport. Uh, you know, these are the basics, just simple basics of facility management, right? And creation of of a sports facility in, in the country. And in a country like India, I think that's a big barrier. You've got enough barriers for women to enter sport. And I think this is a simple one that can be broken. And, uh, and that's where I think, you know, just getting to understand how uh, facilities are catered to both men and women equally can make such a big difference as well. Thanks for that, uh, both of you. I think you're right. There's a lot we can crack on with in the meantime during COVID-19 uh, to create opportunities for women in sport. Uh, so, Naina, a question from you from Shobha Makurla, um, and it's a little bit connected to the Australian High Commission, but uh, the AHC has supported cricket matches for people who are blind. Uh, and as an extension, are you considering holding sport competitions for disabled in India? And maybe uh, that might be a power to reckon with, and are you considering it? Uh, and I'll add to that a question about adding on to just what Sahail said about what can we do for uh, uh, disabled people in sport at the moment. And I can say before I hand over to Sunaina that's something the High Commission is really focused on. Um, we continue to support, um, uh, we've done blind cricket, we've had stuff to do with the deaf cricket uh, uh, associations in India, and we plan to keep that going. We see that as really important uh, and a, an area of engagement between Australia and India. But Sunaina, any thoughts about uh, disability in sport at the moment? 
Um, well, it's fantastic to hear that we are doing uh, some work in the di disability space um, in India as well. I think uh, in my role specifically, it's extremely, uh, even within 10 A's, we work with a lot of underrepresented groups, uh, disability being one of them. And I think uh, we... One thing I'd just like to start with, like there are obviously partnerships and things that I can mention, but what I did notice is that we've organized social and fun programs where people with a disability, I've been on court and hit a ball with them. Uh, and I think that's the thing about this, like, you know, we keep saying underrepresented groups and, um, you know, people who, yeah, it just, it, I think that we need to treat it differently. It is a disability, but people have done so much and they don't see themselves as different. As different. So I think that uh, uh, collaborating or doing a program with people who can come, it doesn't have to be competitive, it's social. Uh, you're 90 minutes, you're having an open session for tennis, there's music, and that's, we have one of the programs that we run is open court session. Uh, there's some of us on, uh, you know, wheelies playing, uh, and yeah, they were just better than me at some point, and I was just having to <laughs> run for the ball and trying to uh, get the ball across the net. But uh, I think that's important. We, when you say you want to make sport inclusive, it's actually creating a delivery network where the community is truly welcome and re represented. And um, I think that could be done with the, with the way we do it. Is inclusion gala days that you run you want to make it a fun experience for people coming in providing them with equipment providing them with uh you know wheelchairs if they don't have it though most people do but you know having the equipment there to make it work coming for them um i think uh even showcasing uh underrepresented groups and having a little bit of a community engagement at major events makes so much difference because it actually uh, reaches out to the community and tells people because those are the major events that actually get broadcasted. So, you know, if you want to build that culture of an inclusive space, uh, it's also about educating everyone in the country about, uh, you know, we there are people playing the sport, so come and join us. Uh, so we've uh, done a lot. We, we do have partnerships with uh, sporting. We were trying to get a partnership with sporting release associations, get more people playing tennis, there is uh, uh, the National Disability Insurance Scheme that actually supports programs in Australia uh, on funding for any costs that are associated with disabilities. So, um, yeah, and I think one of the main things is also with the coaches or the people who are, as I said, the delivery network, uh, just educating them about you know, how to be around. I think it can be tough. When I started in this role, it was a little challenging because I think you've not been in that space before, but as you just about everyone being comfortable where they are and creating programs where everyone can be involved. So, yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, Sanaina. So um, just with the time remaining, just pulling together the strands of a number of um, questions uh, for our three panellists uh, to finish up on, um, what is the future of India Australia sports collaboration. Where do we go from here? Where do you see the greatest opportunities? And just to flag some of the some of the the ideas and opportunities that some of our alumni have mentioned. Uh, Ravneet Power uh, has noted the new education policy and university links. Uh, Harsh Jain on technology engagement. Uh, uh, Gargan Puri on Australian facilities uh, and how where India can go to go be better at the Olympics and. Uh, uh, a few questions on Pradeep from Pradeep Kuparaju, Avajit Chawan, and Suprakit Ghosh on uh, uh, Australian football codes and where they fit into the piece. Uh, but they're just a few ideas. Uh, to start off, um, we'll probably have a, about, a, about a minute each for everyone to kind of give their kind of headline points. Uh, we'll start with Sahail. I think all those headlines you just read out pretty much sum up uh, all of it. I mean, really good points there from from all the questions actually. Because I, I think I think tech is a big one, right? I think we're heading into a, uh, an age where uh, I like the term globalization, right? Global localization, where we're in that sort of phase where uh, the world has gotten even smaller, if that was even possible. But uh, look, I mean, I run a, a startup that runs on sort of tech and sport, and uh, I just think 
uh, the reality is in India, you're able to pull off things which at 115th or 120th the cost as you would in Australia, but you've got the expertise in something else that you might have in Australia, which you could lean on. And I think that's an obvious synergy to, to get companies and startups that maybe are looking for an inroad into India, which has a, a market size of 1.2 billion people. And you've got really talented young startups here that have great ideas, great networks within sporting fraternities as well. Uh, and I think there's a great synergy there to, to tap into uh, and look for you know, these collaborations with Indian companies. That's one. Uh, obviously, the second thing being the university games and, and the culture there, I do think there's room to, to create co cross partnerships and, and maybe have an India-Australia university games, identify some of the top uh, students and, and athletes across disciplines and maybe send them across from the Kalo India games or, or the university games to Australia to go get trained for a two to three month period. I know how much it did for me as a cricketer. Uh, I, I know India is up against it today in terms of uh, you know being quite advanced, but these are just some of it. I mean, I could go on with uh, with synergies, right? And I think uh, you know that's a larger chat uh, when I meet you guys uh, in person as well. And I'd, I'd love to sort of have that opportunity to to explore that. But I just think there's there's so many opportunities in in a world that's getting smaller and smaller and relying on so much tech as well. Brilliant. There's a lot for us to unpack there in future conversations. So Nina. Um, yeah, I think you did mention that the, both of you have covered a lot of points, but um, I did as, as in terms of um, I think mentorship programs is something that uh, would assist a lot of people, uh, future and em emerging leaders within the sport. you have got professional development uh, workshop opportunities that are already happening, sharing experiences like opportunities like these webinars and keeping people connected. Um, I would like to touch upon one thing in terms of uh, support and knowledge in terms of accreditations and courses. Um, and this comes from feedback from one of my university batchmates who has moved back to India. And I think the challenges uh, that they face in in you know, there's obviously a lot of support and pathways on court, but um, in in order to create pathways for people actually working or wanting to take up a career as a coach, and you know, so you go from a community level to a, a junior development level, and then you know, to an elite level. So things like that, I think, where we can share that knowledge in between Australia and India, you've got. Uh, um, ways of encouraging, um, sorry, uh, improving uh, sustainable facilities and empowering our communities with resources to actually be able to run those and do that. Um, sport and recreation funding opportunities have been great during the time of COVID for our community clubs. So I think that is something uh, in partnership or any funding opportunities for people out there. Uh, as I already touched upon, encouraging more partnerships, uh, special schools, uh, for disability uh, associations, um, linguistically diverse communities, gender diversity, and you know, actually working through these partnerships, as we have mentioned, some really good private startups there, uh, government organizations, how that trickles down into uh, the state, and then overall just having a strategic approach to roll it out in the next few years. Um, we'll be in a much better space, I call it. Lots of good ideas there for us to work on. Um, our Commissioner. Oh, look, just briefly, Pat, I, I, you know, uh, I think that this crisis has uh, reinforced to us how we can use social media to connect. I think knowledge and experience uh, exchange uh, is really good. And whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, formal academic, whether it's mentoring, or as Sahail said, whether it's uh, Australian sports uh, uh, which have returned to the field, uh, in team sports, whether it's uh, any of the codes of football, uh, ex explaining how they're operating their bubble, their learnings to make it easier for the next sport that wants to uh, uh, to take their cab off the rank. And I, I think I think you know, glo localization is a fantastic word uh, because the technology we're using tonight and many other variations have kept us in touch, and and, and happily we're reaching out for each other even more at this time. Thanks to that High Commissioner, and that might be something that we can talk to with our Australian sporting bodies um, following this conversation, sharing our knowledge and experience with bubbles, um, including with the IPL as well. They might be able to teach us a few things as well. Um, before we finish, uh, could I ask everyone if they wouldn't mind turning their cameras back on, who's on the call? We'd just love to get a photo of everyone. Um, if you mind doing that, just give everyone a chance to do that. Our, photo, our camera here is always on, of course. <laughs> it's all Pat's ego.
Yeah, yeah, it's always good. Have it on. <laughs> thanks, everyone. So, um, our, our team in the other room are just taking some photos. So, thanks very much for that. And, and while they do all do that, I'd just like to thank our panelists tonight, Sanina Jaswell, the Hale Chandler, and the High Commissioner Barry O'Farrell for, I think, outlining for us. I think where look sometimes with COVID-19 we can all get a little bit pessimistic but there's some opportunities there there's things that we can explore between Australia and India and um, I don't know about the rest of you but that's really motivated me to get into the opportunities in the sports sector between our countries so uh, thank you to our panelists and thank you to the alumni across India and those in Australia who've come up with some brilliant questions really focused us on key issues and finally thanks to all of you who have come on to participate tonight Thank you all and have a good evening. Thanks. Ruby, thank you, Thanks. panelists. Thank you. Look forward to meeting you both. Thank you. Thank you for having us.